a chilling tale of some real-life zombies. Eric Williams from Delaware was mopping his kitchen floor when a dead beetle began to mutate in front of his eyes. From its body, something long and worm-like was emerging. And Eric wasn't the only one to witness this miniature horror. No idea what those things are. I see all these strange hairs moving around. What do you think that is? It's a No, no, look at the string just coming out of it. Oh my god. All of these records had that one thing in common. Be it a mopped floor or nearby puddle, the presence of water was triggering these writhing worms. That's disgusting. But what were they? And how had they got into the bodies of these insects? Biologist Janice Moore has spent her lifetime fascinated by this particular weird event. Whenever I was a child, I used to see these long worms sort of squiggling around my grandfather's horse trough. And I was told they were horsehair worms, and that is their common name because legend has it that these worms come from horsehairs. Well, in reality, they're parasites, and they're parasites of, oh, crickets, grasshoppers, that sort of animal. These parasites live inside, say, the cricket, and grow up to be huge compared to the cricket, all coiled up. The cricket is almost total parasite. The hairworm larva develops snug inside the host insect's body. But to complete the life cycle, it has to breed. And to do this, it needs to find water. And rather than leave the safety of the host, the hairworm has no qualms with making the poor insect do all of the legwork. This fiendish parasite alters the host's behavior. So at that point, the cricket becomes almost suicidally attracted to water. And they've been reported to jump into toilets, into dog watering bowls. And if the hairworm's big enough, the merest hint of moisture can be enough to tempt it out. What is it? I've never seen anything like that before. Keep an eye out for these miniature body snatchers, because they're found here in the UK too. In fact, in every corner of the globe, super sneaky parasite species have found ways to get others to do the hard work for them. For example, the mind controller that lurks in German gardens. So there's a really fun parasite. The scientific name is Leucochloridium, and it actually lives in the intestinal tract of a variety of songbirds. The parasitic flatworm reaches maturity inside the digestive system of the bird and casts out its eggs in the bird's droppings. This would be the end of the cycle for Leucochloridium if it weren't for the garden snail that finds bird droppings irresistible. When they eat these eggs, uh, the egg hatches and the little larval parasite, a flatworm called a trematode, uh, moves into the tentacles of the snail. And there, it grows up into a kind of a striped mass. The snail's tentacle is now one enormous, pulsating flatworm brood sac. But here, our parasitic mastermind encounters a problem. Just like the hairworm, it can't breed in the snail. To lay its eggs, it once again needs to be back inside a bird's intestinal tract. So how does the fickle flatworm complete the cycle? Mind control. It forces the usually reclusive snail upward toward the light. Once exposed, the snail's tentacle is a pulsating grub on a plate. Birds will look at this and say, aha, good to eat, and they'll eat it. And in that way, the life cycle is complete. Now, the poor snail is the middleman. It might just get out alive, minus a tentacle. But other hosts are not so lucky. Our next parasite requires its host to make the ultimate sacrifice. 
So one of the most spectacular examples of zombie behavior is that of ants infected with a fungus. If you were battling for space in the rainforest, hitching a ride on the back of an ant would seem to be a clever tactic. But it's not nearly clever enough for the cordyceps fungus, which is a bit of a control freak. Mind control, that is. The fungus enters the body through the ant's windpipe, where it begins to extract nutrients from all but its major organs. As the fungus grows, it eats the ant alive, whilst leaving it with just enough of its faculties to move. And the reason why it does this is brilliantly devious. To cast spores, the fungus needs to be high, so it floods the ant's brain with chemicals, forcing it on an upward march. Having reached an optimum height, the ant has served its purpose, and cordyceps devours its brain. Before, with a final flourish, it bursts through the exoskeleton and casts spores into the air. It's really a wonderful story if you happen to be reading about it, and a really nasty story if you happen to be an ant. One of my favourite types of body snatchers actually lives in UK waters. The larvae of a species of tapeworm inhabits the stickleback. And just like all of the other parasites we've been looking at, when it needs to breed, it needs another host, in this case, birds. Quite obviously, it doesn't leap out of the mouth of the stickleback into a passing bird. No, what it does is very cleverly modify the stickleback's behaviour, causing it to flip over onto its back and reveal its bright white belly, making it far more obvious to predators like herons. Now, I know it's a sad end for the old stickleback, but you've got to admit that when it comes to parasites, mind control is a fiendishly effective survival technique. Bending the will of others for your own gain is not exactly the most altruistic of survival methods.